Lots of room. He's 40. Like a rocket. Look at Jinty go. Breaks a tackle. He's 20. He's 10. He's touchdown. Here's a long run. Oklahoma State going to do it again. And guess who? Big O. To the house. Milrow going to run it again. Got a lane. Kicked in the turbo. Milrow. Welcome into the third of a series of three preseason shows. This one, Mike, we're looking at receivers. My partner, Mike Bainbridge, is here. My name is Joe DeSalvo with the CFF site. And Mike, before we jump into this receiver slash tight end show, let's just remind everybody we are in mid-July, and that means draft season's heating up with college fantasy football, and that means the CFF site has everything ready to go for your drafts for your 2024 college fantasy football season, the preseason fantasy draft guides available. The preseason projections are available and live. The great thing about those two products, you and I spend a lot of time between now and the the beginning of the season updating those projections, updating the preseason fantasy draft guide. So it really is fluid and things will be changing fast as preseason camps heat up. And then, of course, as you get in the season, we're going to have all the content you've known to grow and love from the CFF site. Mike's going to have his DFS write-ups. I'll do my notes and observations. We'll have the weekly waiver wire write-ups, the weekly projections. Of course, we've got the Discord where, man, you can't get enough information in that Discord from team news to general news to player prop news, guys looking for leagues you want to join leagues we've got recruitment page uh channels in there as well just everything you need for your college fantasy season coming up and more dfs prop betting whatever we've got it ready to rock and roll so mike receivers here we go any overlying you know theme for you this year that may be different from previous seasons with receivers or it's still the same you know got a couple of elite guys at the top from there, it's kind of a difference of opinion, who you like, and a lot of value at the end. Uh, for me, that seems to be sort of the the status quo every year at receiver. Any different for you this year? Not particularly. Um, you know, we always kind of you kind of look at the rankings to start, and you're like, ah, oh, man, it kind of seems shallow. You know, there's not there's a lot of question marks kind of beyond the top 25, top 30. Um, that's kind of, you know, that's kind of atypical for, for a CFF off season. But then once fall camp start rolling around, we're going to see some position battles happening. Um, you're going to get a little bit of clarity, uh, for, for some of these, you know, battles for wide receiver one, wide receiver two and so forth. And, um, you know, then, then, you know, the wide receiver position will start looking the same as, as years past. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the good thing is, as we look really at our top 10 and we're, you know, there's so many receivers we're going to get to. So we're going to kind of be short and sweet with a lot of names. But when you look at some of these receivers in the top 10, one thing that really jumped out to me when I was just kind of planning before the show was there's a lot of stability at receiver within the top 10. And what I mean by stability, returning players in systems that we're used to another season. I mean, as I look at the top 10, Luther Burden, right? He's back. Cook's back, same system. Torrey Horton, same thing, returning quarterback. Tez Johnson, same system. He's back, of course. You know, Dylan Gabriel is just sort of like, you know, that's experienced quarterback back. So I don't think there's see any drop off there, right? McMillan over at Arizona may be the only player inside the top 10. I mean, Royals, I mean, there should be consistency with the system. Ricky White as well. Ashlock at Hawaii. Atkins is back at South Florida. Hobart with Texas State. Just that's what we see every year with the rankings. And that's one thing that really jumps out is that when you have that returning talent coming back, those are the guys that usually stand out at the top. Uh, but McMillan for me, and I, I, you know, that's one that we'll, we'll kind of start with because I know that that's a guy for you that you have ranked number one. And it's just a difference of opinion. He's not that far off for me, uh, but just the change in a little bit of a system, but you, you know, he should get a ton of targets in that system, right? 
Yeah, I was going to say, you know, you're you're kind of asking me that question, but you actually are kind of out on your own island in terms of, I guess, the CFF industry with where you have uh, Tet McMillan, probably, what was it, beyond, outside of your overall top 10, I believe? Yeah, I have him at the, at the number four receiver right now. I put him over Jalen Royals, and I think that's just considering the, all the latest information on Blake Anderson. So I did put him up over, over Royal. So I do have him at four. Um, I mean, look, I do have hesitation sometimes when you're coming in new coaching system, new team. I mean, look, Arizona did lose some players. Is it easy for, to, for, I mean, when I think of that, I've got Luther burden at one, I don't think there's any, I mean, look, are we splitting hairs, whether you've got burden or McMillan there at one, right? I like the system that Horton's in. He comes back. I just, you know, he's going to get a boatload of targets. I just like the fact that I know what I'm getting there. And we know the system at Oregon. And I feel, you know, you've got Tez Johnson and Evan Stewart. Of course, you can make a case maybe that McMillan would be over Johnson. Because there's some that feel Evan Stewart might be the better option at Oregon. I think that's debatable. But Tez Johnson is my guy. And then I got McMillan. So, you know, here's the thing when I, when we're looking at these players right here. Really, the only difference between me drafting Luther Burden and McMillan might be where I land in a draft slot. Quite honestly, because I can see myself take a taking drafting Luther Burden if I had a top five, top six pick overall full FBS format. Um, I'm not, you know, for me, I don't really love McMillan right there. But, you know, coming back middle of the second round, that's a spot where maybe I have a McMillan or it just depends on where I'm drafting. But according to everybody else's rankings, McMillan may go off the board before burden anyway. So I don't have any shares of McMillan. I don't anticipate I have any or getting any because everybody values them more than where I have them right now. So, yeah, I mean, which is fine. It's just, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're thinking there's any chance of getting Tet McMillan in the second round, it's just never going to happen. Right. He's always going to be drafted in the first. And I think the really for me is the only hesitation is kind of the comments made by Brent Brennan at the big 12 media days commenting like, you know, he's Tet McMillan really to start fall camp might not be full, full go uh, coming off that uh, off season procedure. So, um, you know, but then there's opposite ends where, you know, Tet McMillan kind of, you know, alluded to the fact that he's going to be 100% healthy too. So um, I think health is really the only determining factor for him. I mean, look, can you name, well, yeah, I asked this question a lot, but like, who's the wide receiver too, right? Malachi Riley, maybe, uh, Lamonius Craig, never done anything. I think you get a returning quarterback. He's going to get at least uh, like hundred targets is, is a hundred percent happening, right? Um, just, there's nobody else to throw to, and he's got a, a, a great quarterback throwing it to him. So, um, I don't see any real bust potential with McMillan outside of potential injury. No, I mean, look, I, I, I like any of those guys inside my top four. Yeah. I, I wouldn't have a problem having any of them on my squad. Uh, we did, you and I have spoken, you know, off air about this a couple of days ago, just the Blake Anderson incident at Utah state. Uh, you know, I, I think we're going to be okay going into this year but when there is some change sometimes you worry about what how that's going to affect the players mindsets and really just long term as the season progresses see what's happened hopefully this isn't what isn't one of those situations where you know you the Aggies kind of have a downturn halfway through the year and some guys start jumping ship you know right that's the one thing you worry about but the system if it stays true which it Barbie's potentially could, Royals. yeah. The wide receiver coach, I believe, is staying on, and um, you know that helps obviously. Just having your position coach stay, and I think whoever's going to be calling plays is, um, you know, been within that system previously. So I don't anticipate yeah. that changing too much um, this late in the summer. Ricky White going to get a ton of targets in that go-go offense with UNLV. Of course, the only change there is going to be a change at quarterback, but they've got some guys there. They'll figure that system out. You've got Ashlock at Hawaii, which we like both. You know, he and Stephen McBride, the only knock, uh, knock on him is that he's got three bye weeks during the season, right? So just that extra bye week doesn't help. Sean Atkins, Joey Herbert, Texas State, Xavier Restrepo, upgrade at quarterback for Miami with Cam Ward. Um, anybody there inside the top 10 that you just want to kind of put a bow on before we move outside of the top 10? Uh, 
Ricky White is somebody that I just haven't drafted to this point. Not, and I, I guess I don't really have a, t- a concrete reason why. You just think that I, you don't know how sustainable his his 100 plus targets will be. I mean, they added a couple pieces via the transfer portal. You got to change a quarterback. Um, don't necessarily think it's going to be an upgrade at quarterback from a passing perspective. They'll, their, their replacement for uh, will at UNLV will be a dual threat guy. So he could be really good in college fantasy, but I'm not sure he's going to be as good a passer as Jaden Mayava. Um, so I don't know how replicable his 130 some targets that he got last year. Um, but I mean, that's the only guy that in this inside the top 10 that I really don't have any shares of, but, um, kind of like you said, like there's a lot of stability with inside that top 10 guys that produced last year. And then if, if they have a change at quarterback, it's a Dylan Gabriel stepping in for Bo Nix, right. Or, um, you know, uh, um, Texas state, right. Where, um, Jordan McLeod steps in for TJ Finley, right? So you, you have not stability, but you have a good passer at quarterback. Yeah. I mean, you've got ever, you know, Evan Stewart at 11. I've got him just past you. Uh, Trey Harris, uh, Ole Miss. I mean, you already mentioned on the quarterback show that your hot take could be hot prediction that Jackson Dart finishes as QB one. That happens. Trey Harris, he has to have a wide receiver one. He's the guy for you. And then Eugene Wilson, at 13 uh, from Florida, KC Concepcion, any one of those guys you want to kind of just kind of give a little tidbit on? You've got Stewart, Harris, Wilson, Concepcion. Those are kind of like your 11 through 14s. Yeah, KC Concepcion is uh, one guy that I actually haven't drafted a ton of this year. He just, he was tremendous. He won me the 50-teamer last year um, it just for how good he was as a freshman. You just you're a little concerned that the improved depth uh, at wide receiver for NC State, right? You bring in Wesley yep. Grimes, uh, you bring in Noah Rogers from from Ohio State. Uh, you don't know necessarily that he's going to get that thirty percent target share that he got last year. Not to mention how much he was utilized in the run game. I think he had what forty some fifty carries, maybe. Yep, he, he say that. Him. Yep. Who's to say that he gets that this year now that they have a legitimate running back one in, in Jordan Waters? You know, maybe they don't utilize him in the in the ground game as much. So um, that's a guy I can see like being drafted second, third round that maybe doesn't hit value this year. Um, I think he'll be, you know, I think he'll be productive. Right. But just not maybe he takes a step back from that production uh, last year. Yeah. Well, one player I'll touch on real quick of those is is probably Eugene Wilson. Something that we spoke about. I mean, last year, if I just look at Wilson's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven games with at least six catches last year, 90 yards was as high. He didn't even top the 90. He, he didn't really even get, he only topped 80 yards twice, right? Not a big yardage guy. Did find the end zone. He, probably more valuable, in my opinion, in full PPR. Uh, that's the one for me that I don't have quite as high. We, we have some, I guess, a little bit of a difference of opinion. You know, whenever you start getting 12, 13 spots apart, it makes for a good talking point. Um, but, you know, you, you obviously like him. You've got Graham Mertz back for another year. You got Lagway there in the background waiting. Uh, but a big year for Florida because um, the coach needs, needs a good year this year. Yeah, I just – it was – I, first of all, I love Eugene Wilson. I mean, he had a 80% catch rate last year. That's absurd for how many targets he got um, as a true freshman, right? Yeah. And when you hear a coach, and granted, this was back in the spring before they got Elijah Badger via the transfer portal, but when you hear a coach say, we're going to do everything in our power to literally force feed this guy targets, like that's what more can you ask for from, from a fantasy perspective, right? You want to hear that a guy is going to get volume and it sounds like that's, what's going to happen with Eugene Wilson. Um, Kind of like DJ Lagway, they're going to want to feature these younger players to be like, Hey coach, keep me around. Like I, you know, don't, I'm speaking in terms of Florida head coach, Billy Napier of like, Hey, this is why you want to keep me on as head coach to keep these young talents here on the field. So um yeah, I just I like that they're the coach is saying, hey, we're gonna get this guy the football. Um Elijah Badger kind of dropped his value for me a little bit, but uh not you know, 
I, and I agree with you. Full yeah. point PPR for Eugene Wilson is is where he's most valuable. Well, looking at targets, I mean, there's another guy close up on your list too, Jamal Pritchard, South Alabama. I mean, that that wide receiver one in South Alabama is going to get a ton of targets. When I look at Pritchard, I I, I really like him. But if I, he, you know, he's only 5'8", 164. Uh, I think for me, eight touchdowns last year seemed like that's, you know, that seemed rather high um, for a guy. Sometimes, you know, s- small receivers like that don't put up the big red zone or touchdown type numbers. Can we, uh, you know, we're expecting similar numbers this year. Um, any concern for Jamal Pritchard as wide receiver one at South Alabama? Uh s- Maybe, um, you know, Devin Voison comes back from injury this year. And if you remember back, back late 2022, especially in that bowl game, um, he was their number one guy basically in, in the month of November and then in the bowl game. Yep. So him coming back fully from fully healthy from injury, does he, does he revert back to form and become maybe the potential wide receiver one? But I think you saw from Pritchett last year, especially in the second half, um, how good he is. Um, and you want the wide receiver one in the system three out of the last four years, a hundred plus targets for the wide receiver one. So even with the change at quarterback, I think, you know, the wide receiver one for South Alabama will be valuable. Yep. We both feel very, pretty confident, especially after spring Jeremy Bernard, Alabama comes over from Kalen DeBoer. I think the confidence is, you know, looks like he, for all intent and purposes, he's going to be the true wide receiver one there. You got Squirrel White at Tennessee. Like, you know, will we see maybe a tick up in his production now that we probably have a better passer in Nico there at quarterback? And then Will Pauling, you know, another guy much, I think, similar for me to maybe to a Eugene Wilson where he's going to be a target magnet in that offense, right? What about those three names? Yeah, Bernard, I think just solidified wide receiver one there. Um, and I, I don't I think the gap is pretty wide between the wide receiver one and the wide receiver two at Alabama. I think it's more just Milrow and how good of a passer he is is gonna determine uh Bernard's value this year. Squirrel right, I really like this year because we have the upgrade at quarterback for Tennessee. Yep. And I kind of did some research, you know. He got heavy volume still last year, just under a hundred targets. Um, his a dot average depth of target was around eight, eight, something, I think 8.1, 8.5, something in that range. If you look back the previous year, um, Jalen Hyatt, who also started in the slot, uh, in the system, similar to squirrel white had a a dot of 11.1. So if you get that same volume, right. Same number of targets and they start stretching the field a little bit more with squirrel white he could end up being a really good value, potential top 10 uh, wide receiver this year. Yeah. You know, I, I think Rock Taylor, you know, makes sense. You and I have him around that 20 range. Uh, we mentioned how good that Memphis offense should be. Seth Hedigan, returning quarterback. But a name I want to talk about just, just a minute or two, because I think it we we kind of teased this on the quarterback show as well, is we've got a Mecca Egbuka. You've got him at 22. Uh, I've got him probably somewhere in that range. I, I, I'm not seeing him right here on my list, but I've got so many names here in front of me. I don't know where I have him, but I actually have him at 12. So I do have him a little higher. But let's talk a little bit about that because I think this is maybe one or or maybe one team where I think it's worth just a couple of minute conversation with the Ohio State receivers. Chip Kelly comes in. You know, we're used to seeing, you know, last last few years, Ohio State offense spreading around three quality fan you know we went into the season the last couple of years basically on these shows explaining or you know kind of showing that there are three could be three fantasy relevant receivers for Ohio State historically speaking Chip Kelly's system really only churns out one really relevant fantasy receiver um I'm expecting the same thing this year. Are you expecting anything different? Because there's uh, some talent at receiver at Ohio State. Yeah, it's twofold because you if you if you look at Chip Kelly specifically, last six years he hasn't had a wide receiver above uh, finish above wide receiver fifty six. So us having him even in the Mecca Ibuka even in the top twenty five is kind of bucking the trend there, right? But then you start you know. 
Emeka Ibuka is going to be a first round draft pick. Chip Kelly has never had a first round draft pick uh, at receiver. I don't believe, or at least a first round deserving talent. So, um, and then just kind of, you know, the question mark, you, we think this is going to be a more run heavy offense because of Chip Kelly, but this is still Ohio state and it's still Ryan day. So they might throw the ball a little bit more than what we saw UCLA did with Chip Kelly. So um yeah, I, I feel more comfortable where I have a Buka rank than maybe you per se, but this is also a first round NFL draft pick, right? So if if somebody's going to buck that trend, it's probably going to be somebody. Well, th- this is why I made that comment when we were doing the quarterbacks that I felt Chip Kelly was going to be a one and done offensive coordinator this year. I think all the chips are in the middle of the table. It's national championship of Boston. I think win or lose, I think he's gone no matter what. And here's why. If that trend holds, there's too much talent at receiver. They, 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 you know, they run the chance of losing some of that talent and transferring out. And, you know, these other quarterbacks that they have that could sling the ball around a little bit. I just, I feel like that the system, they got Henderson, they've got Judkins, they've, you know, they've got Will Howard from Kansas State. The offense seems to be, the chess pieces on the board seem to tell me this is a Chip Kelly type of system. But looking at the talent on the roster, long term, I just don't see how Kelly stays OC and they're able to hold on to those pieces. So I wanted to circle back to that comment that I made at the quarterback show on my feelings on that. Now, the one that really jumps out to me with your rankings a little bit and not so much jumps out at me is Brennan Presley at Oklahoma State at 23. The reason why I think that one jumps out at me, Mike, and we could just spend a minute there, is that you also have Rashad Owens at Oklahoma State at 31. This is a team that that ran the ball a lot, and they're going to feed Ollie Gordon quite a few carries. Uh, Oklahoma As State, punishment, apparently. <laughs> well, yeah, right, but Oklahoma State, you know, they, you know, the wide receiver won there, maybe not in the last couple of years, but the years before that was extremely valuable in college fantasy football. Uh, but are we, can we get two that justifies two Oklahoma State quarterbacks with Alan Bowman at quarterback in the top 35? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously I ranked them that way. I think so. I mean, I, as much as they did run the ball last year, like they're bringing back everybody in uh, in terms of offensively, collectively, right? So mm-hmm. all the pieces come back uh, at wide receiver, offensive line, quarterback, obviously. Um, so I just, I think that we're going to see an improved, maybe passing offense, regardless of how much they they run Ollie Gordon. You know, Alan Bowman, as, as much as we kind of downplayed it, he played relatively well when he was healthy last year. So, um, yeah, maybe two guys that high is probably a stretch, but I mean, look at Brennan Presley, 140 targets in 14 games last year. Um, and maybe we see a shift, uh, towards, you know, some more t- If I mean, they only threw for what 21 touchdowns last year, everybody yep. back, you would assume that number kind of jumps a little bit. Um, and I, I think if there's more touchdowns, it's probably going to the outside receiver and Rashad Owen. So I, I've spoke about this with the quarterbacks too. I'm loving these offenses that bring you back yeah. pretty much the entire unit. Right? Yeah. Look, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to scare anybody off. I mean, look, by all means, look at, look at what Memphis, I mean, we've got Seth Hennigan, top 10 quarterback. You've got Rock Taylor. You've got uh, what Bla- uh, Demir uh, Blakumsi. And then we've got, um, Mario Anderson as one of the top running backs. So again, Oklahoma State could be set up very similarly. So I'm not trying to scare anybody off. It's just given what we've seen from Oklahoma State the last couple of years, it feels like, oh, okay, maybe they've got some pieces together where maybe, you know, they challenge like maybe it's them in Utah out of the the Big 12 this year. So we'll see how that shakes up. I think the other guys that we have there in the next range, I mean, Deion Burks, we've got him projected as wide receiver one at Oklahoma and at Seth Latrell system. A uh, huge spring game was sort of like his coming out party at Oklahoma. So if there's any telltale signs there, we're expecting a big year from him. Caden Robinson over at Appalachian State, wide receiver one. That offense is going to put the ball in the air. Jaden Higgins, Iowa State. Let's just take a minute on Cole Wilson, Texas State, because they're, uh, you know, you can maybe make a case that Cole Wilson may have more value at where he's being drafted right now compared to Joey Hobart, who – we have as a top 10 preseason wide receiver right now. You can get 
Wilson a little bit later in drafts, but he's going to get a ton of targets too, right? Yeah, and he's somebody that's crept up a little bit of late. Cole Wilson was getting drafted right around the 10th to 11th round range uh, back in March and April. Now you can't, you you have to jump up to the seventh round um, to get Cole Wilson. We, you know, we, you look back and we included this in the guide, five of the last seven games last year for Texas State. It was Cole Wilson and not Joey Hobart that was uh, the leading target getter for Texas State. Um, credit to the G5 Hive podcast. Um, They had a recent Texas State interview, and there might have been some bias there with their interviewees because uh, they had, I think it sounded like they previously interviewed Cole Wilson, Mm -hmm. Uh, but they, they alluded to the fact that he might be their wide receiver one over Joey Hobart. So I really like the value um, that you get with, with Cole Wilson, uh, even though you have to go a little bit higher uh, to get him now. Um, And I think the underrated aspect of Texas state this year, you know, they lose 70 to 80 targets now that Ashton Hawkins is with Baylor and, you know, people have taken shots late on, uh, you know, some wide receiver three options, but who's to say that somebody just emerges and gets 80 targets this year. What if they just funnel more and more targets to Cole Wilson and Joey Hobart, and there is really no reliable wide receiver three. So um, if they get a centralized target share between the, just those two alone, I mean, both of them could be uh, top 20, even top 10 uh, wide receivers. This yeah. Year. Well, look here, the, the, you know, the next few guys here, and we're, we're getting outside of the top 25. So we're going to kind of go quick hitters here. Uh, but, you know, here's, here's a name, Colin Lacey at Louisville, right? I mean, this is going to be a wa- possible wide receiver one at Louisville, um, at least that's the way we have it projected right now. And we know that in that system, that has potential to get a ton of targets and be a tremendous fantasy value as well. Where you're at on Colin Lacey right now at this point in the summer? Uh, res- reserved optimism, I think is the best way to describe it. I still have, a, I have a wide receiver 28. It doesn't help that he wasn't there in the spring. So we really don't yes. know how his rapport with the quarterback, Tyler Shuck, um, or you know just how he performed. Yep. But I still think he's the best wide receiver on the roster. If we're sticking to system, though, it, what eight of the last nine, nine of the last ten under Jeff Brom, the wide receiver one has played the boundary, right? And that's going to be Chris Bell, who caught two touchdowns in the spring game. Could be Ja'Cory Brooks, maybe the Alabama transfer. But typically, the wide receiver one plays outside. Colin Lacey will be running in the slot. This will be a fall camp battle that we absolutely have to pay attention to. And I will say this, too. Like based upon Louisville reports last year, remember with Jamari Thrash, two years ago, you kept hearing report after report about Charlie Jones at Purdue, even though we didn't believe it. There was just constant chatter about him being the wide receiver one. We usually find out based upon spring re- or uh, practice reports with Jeff Brom, whichever team he's at, who's kind of leading the way in terms of the wide receiver battle. So that'll be one to really focus on. Yeah, the one name that I've been on for for quite some time is just uh, Denzel Boston. Boston. Jed Fish comes over from Arizona. Um, you know, Denzel Boston, I think there were some that maybe thought Jeremiah Hunter would, would be projected wide receiver one. We've got Boston there. He had a solid spring. You know, there is a little hesitation. Again, much like the same conversation we had with Oregon, Washington's entering the Big Ten. New coaching staff. Uh, they've got some things shake. I mean, look, they, they're not going to be anywhere near what they were last year. I mean, that offensive line has just, you know, it has to be completely rebuilt. But there's some good pieces there. And I would argue that if you're going to want a piece of Washington, you're going to want a piece of the receiving core because there's a chance that they're going to be having to throw the ball around. They've got a Jed, you know, Jed Fish is there as the head coach. Um, that's why I like Boston. Any quick thoughts on him? Uh, for uh, each of the last four years, and that's including a terrible Arizona team back in 2021 where Jed Fish was the head coach, uh, all the wide receiver ones in that span hit 100 targets. Um, so even if Washington is bad this year, there's still precedent that that wide receiver one uh, under Fish is going to get 100 targets. Uh, I was looking back, you know, I noted this in our guide you look back at that Arizona 2021 team, Stanley Berryhill got a hundred targets. His quarterback that year was Will Plummer. Right. Yeah. Uh, so you have at least have an experienced quarterback, regardless of his talent and Will Rogers. Yep. So 
if Denzel Boston does get that wide receiver one distinction, which we think he will, I I think a hundred targets is kind of is easily doable because we know that Washington's likely going to be throwing a lot. They got an experienced quarterback and we have historical precedent. Yep. Uh, another name you, we, you know, we spoke about this when we did the quarterback show, Western Kentucky, you're expecting them to run the ball a little bit more, but we still like Dalvin Smith at wide receiver one there. Right. Yeah, I liked them a lot better when you had tight end designation on fan <laughs> tracks. But you know, yeah. one of the one of the other teams too, where we we're talking about Denzel Boston, if he could hold on to that wide receiver one designation, really has a lot of fantasy value. There seems to be right now, in my opinion, um, I think there's a little bit of that at LSU at receiver too. Right now, we've got Kyron Lacy projected at wide receiver one. We know C.J. Daniels came in the transfer over at Liberty. He was running with the twos in the spring. Some of the reporters uh, that, you know, that were writing about spring camp see where there's no way he's not going to be in the starting lineup come fall. Uh, but they've got some options there at receiver. Right now, we have Kyron Lacey projected at wide receiver one. He was the number three receiver last year. Um, your thoughts about LSU receiver right now with ha- us with having Kyron Lacey projected at wide receiver one? Is that more of a security option right now because we know what we're getting with him yeah it's a yeah yeah and it depends on price too because i've seen him go off in like the fourth or fifth round and just we don't necessarily know that he's going to for sure be you know wide receiver one for the entirety of the season so that price seems a little steep for me um i think what's happened lately and and some people have written about it chris k i know covered it um Xavier thomas mississippi state transfer like this is a guy going beyond round 20 he was the only productive player really on the mississippi state offense last year who's to say that he's not going to be you know one of the more valuable wide receivers for lsu chris hilton a former four-star prospect a lot of spring pub he's going beyond round 20 these are guys that you should probably take shots on yeah. as opposed to you know maybe going up and drafting a, a Kyron Lacey in the fourth fifth round so we think this passing offense is going to be very good actually with with Garrett Nussmeyer um but I, I think you know it, it might be a collective effort too who knows yeah well, what I, what I've noticed in some drafts is, is different guys are drafting different players for me i seem to be the one targeting cj daniels and everybody's got their own their own flavor on that but look we can talk about real quick uh there's two more teams we want to get to where we'll need a couple of minutes on same thing with texas i mean we've got i mean we know what tech texas is going to be pretty darn good we've got isaiah bond wide receiver 39 as their wide receiver one is that a little bit because we think they're going to spread it around is it a little bit because we're not definitely sure Isaiah Bond may be the wide receiver one there what's your thoughts real quick on Texas I, I I'm ready for spring report or yep. spring reports I'm ready for fall report fall camp reports there because it just seems like I don't know there's a lot of fluctuation <laughs> with where those Texas receivers are going at one point Matthew Golden was getting drafted as a top like 15 round receiver just as a potential starting receiver now he's not even being drafted at all for some reason um Isaiah Bond seems to, his ADP seems to rise a little bit more um with each draft that I do uh and some people are even taking some of the you know the freshmen there late um so like Jonte Cooks stock seems to fall just a little bit with each passing draft that I do. So um, kind of similar to LSU going to be very good passing game, right? Regardless of who's quarterback there. Um, and I, I think just start taking shots on, on some of these players to maybe spread around your right spread around your uh, who, who you have. You don't want to uh, put all your eggs in one basket, maybe with Isaiah bond, spread it around, get some John take cook. Uh, maybe some Matthew Golden in round 25 or so. and But w- I think we both agree that offense is going to be very good. Yeah, and then one more team I want to talk about real quick is just Washington State because a guy that we had ranked maybe a little bit higher in spring, maybe not so much now, but but he's still up there in a relatively safe spot. I think somewhere in the 30s is just um, Josh Meredith at Washington State where the spring reports come in. Looks like he's going to be the, you know, it seems to be the favorite maybe to land that inside receiver spot, the one that Lincoln Victor held down last year, which we know is going to get a ton of targets. You know, right now, when you look at that offense, you've probably got, um, I'm trying to think of who's the uh, the returning guy. That's uh, Kyle Williams. Sorry. 
Yep. He seems to be right now, in my opinion, the the safer option to draft, but he doesn't, for me, have the inside, the ceiling, fantasy ceiling at that inside receiver spot right now that we have projected Josh Meredith there. Um, what could possibly change that in the coming weeks? Uh, it wouldn't be anything to do with Kyle Williams per se. I think it yes, would be, I agree. Yeah. it would be if we start to get reports for when these fall camps open up that Chris Hudson, the Oregon transfer uh, is starting to make a, a push a move towards that starting uh, wide receiver one spot. It was just, when they and during the spring, when they were doing you know first team, second team offenses, it was Josh Meredith running in the slot with the first team consistently, Chris Hudson in the with the second team. Uh, so again, sound like a broken record. We're gonna have to pay attention to fall camp reports and and see you know if that's if if spring kind of translates to the fall and and Meredith is yep. still running with the ones, then you know you might see his uh, stack rise if you see more fluctuation with with Hudson moving into the ones then maybe you start pivoting away and drafting Hudson more so we'll pay attention to the reports as they come in yeah I think I think just very similar to the LSU situation very similar to the Texas situation right you've got to take a stab with somebody because there's just too much value there to just let it stay on the table and and just bypass it right because you know, we talked about this. Washington State's going to play that Mountain West schedule, right? I mean, the schedule looks really good. Like, Washington State's schedule looks so good that if you can nail down that, right, uh, the, the you know, you can nail down that inside receiver and all the pieces stick that we have projected right now. There's tremendous value at Washington State. Yeah, which, you're looking at their, if you're looking at their Power Four conference opponents, it's Texas Tech, which could be a high-scoring affair, and then Washington, which is going to take a step back. So, yeah. you know, there's potential for shootouts there. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So, look, we'll take a few minutes before we get into tight ends, Mike. And, you know, we're getting outside the top 40 right now. Right. And so, you know, we we, we speak about this all the time. We did it. You know, there, there's certain points where you get to your quarterback rankings and you're like, man, there's a ton of value there. This is where I'm this is where I'm passing quarterbacks right now. And I'm shifting pivoting somewhere else. You get to that point at running backs as well. Sometimes you get to that point at receivers and then you start, even though we have our cheat sheets, our gut tells us who are the players that we're targeting, who no, no matter, even because we have our rankings there in front of us, there's that gut feeling where I might be a, a lot higher on this player than where I have them ranked right now. So as we look outside the top 35, 40, who are a couple of those names or a few of those names that you're t you seem to be targeting in some of the mid to later rounds of drafts. Uh, yeah, I'll just rattle off a few, and I'm sure you'll do the same. Uh, sure. Anto Antoine Wells from Ole Miss, right? I I've said it ad nauseum at this point how high I am on the Ole Miss offense. He's got SEC experience, former 900 yard receiver. I think he could have a really big year. Um, Chris Bell, we kind of talked about the Louisville situation. Uh, if you want to handcuff with Colin Lacey or just draft him where, where he's being drafted right around the 15, 16 round range. I think that's a decent investment. Uh, just going back, Alex Adams at Akron, like he wasn't fully healthy in the spring. He wasn't fully healthy last year. That's why he did nothing last year, but this is a former LSU transfer that had 10 touchdowns in 2022 for Akron. So if he's back healthy, he could have a really big year. Uh, and then let's see. Dylan Goffney is one Colorado state. I think, um, you know, if, if they don't utilize the tight end as much this year with Dylan Holker now uh, in the NFL or graduated, um, you know, he's one that could assume a lot of those tight end targets uh, that occurred last year. So I think he could have a really big year and let's see. Uh, I'll just follow last I, one. I, I, you know, yeah. I, I think you've mentioned before somebody that's gone up your rankings quite a bit, and I'll throw this out because I don't want you to overlook yeah. him. Is is you mentioned to me at one point, Krishan McCray was one at Kent State. He just dominated when he was healthy in the MAC, right? He had ten targets, I think, ten plus targets in like four straight games. Yeah. Um. Just it's the tough part for me is like you know Kent State offense. How how good is it going to be? Um, you know, with, with not a lot of pieces returning from last year. Yep. So, but yeah, when he was healthy in Mac play, he was absolutely dominant. One of the best receivers in the conference. So yeah, and he's I, one with a lot of upside. 
And I feel like Camden Benjamin has sort of uh, been a recent riser for you as well. He's rising for everybody. That's a guy that's going to get a hundred targets this year. So he had a, I mean, he scored uh, 30 plus points in each of the last three games or something around that. Right. Um, or 20 plus points in the last three games. So he was really good uh, at towards the end of last year. And I think he's the solidified wide receiver one there at Tulsa. Yeah. So I look, I'll throw out a couple as well. I think for me, that Camden Benjamin name where you have him ranked for me is the George Moore name is I, I like Jordan Moore, particularly in the PPR formats. I think he's going to get a lot of targets in that Duke offense. Uh, one guy that's, that's gone up the rankings for me significantly because we spoke about this in one of the previous shows is that Indiana schedule. I do like the ability of Elijah Surratt as projected wide receiver one to put up some big numbers early on in the season at Indiana. So he's a guy that I've kind of jumped on a little bit more as I've done some more drafts. Uh, the situation at Utah State has recently scared me off at Ro of Robert Freeman. But as we mentioned, the receiver coach probably is going to take over. But if Freeman can lock down that wide receiver, receiver two spot at Utah State, I think there's incredible value for him. I have him in the 50s. Another player that I know that I've been telling you I've been liking a lot is Jacoby Lane at USC. I'm not big on branch. And I think given the way that Miller Moss throws the football, as we saw in the bowl game, Lane's got the size. He could be a red zone target if Moss gets a situation where he's going to put the ball up. I think Jacoby Lane is a big body. So I really like the value you're getting with him in a Lincoln Riley offense. And another player that I've actually uh, been liking a lot recently, too, I like what he did early on last year. I like what he what he received in regards to targets. We know that Daquan Finn now has gone from Toledo and Tucker Gleason is in. And for some reason, I've really been looking at Jawan Newton lately. There's a lot of questions on uh, the running back situation. Do they have the proven running back one? We know they no longer have, you know, Penny, Penny Boone, right? And so... Um, He's one that I seem to be uh, looking at late in drafts or not late in drafts, but just good value where he's been getting drafted. So that's just sort of a handful of players for me. Is there anybody outside or inside the top 40, 50 for you that's you just like red flag? I, I respect where I have them ranked, but maybe you're avoiding any of those type of players that jump out at you or you feel pretty comfortable with where you're at. Kyron Lacey is probably the one. Um, I just, you know, I have him as a top 40 receiver. Just, I see him getting drafted in the fourth, fifth round sometimes. And that's just way too high for me. So I'm not going to reach, uh, to go get Kyron Lacey, who I don't know that he necessarily guaranteed to hold on to that wide receiver one mantle for the entirety of the season. I feel like another one too, is, uh, for you, based on some of our, our conversations, Noah Smith as well, Sam Houston state. He's I I've kind of said this before that he's the Casey Concepcion as uh, like of the G5. Um, you know, he got those manufactured touches in the running game too, which boosted his value last year. Not sure that that happens. I think they get a, not necessarily a downgraded quarterback, but I don't think they, th Sam Houston throws the ball as much as they did last year. Um, so I think that hurts his uh, value. And then they get back their 2022 leading receiver, uh, if he a day, uh, yeah. so that's another body that you're adding to the wide receiver room. So I don't necessarily think that he gets that high of a target share this year. So I, that's not a player I'm drafting at all, really based on on his ADP. Yeah. And I'll throw one more out that I forgot to mention. And if there's any of them you forget before we move on to tight ends, we can do, uh, I, I just, there's a, there's, there's something inside of me gut feeling. It seems to be, I'm jumping on this player. But I feel like it could be time for Jordan Hudson at SMU this year. They move into the ACC. Um, I think they're going to you know, have to re rely on some of their bigger stars this year. And I that's that's a player that I'm really expecting to make a big jump this year. Yep, absolutely. So let, let, let's, let's transition to tight ends, Mike. I really feel like we don't need to go too deep here because there are some college fantasy leagues that don't incorporate the tight end. I'm a fan of those leagues because I like offense. Uh, but if you play tight end, it's more traditional format. I get it. I'm all for it. We've got the rankings for you, and we've got them on our draft day cheat sheets. I don't think there's any surprise with our top three, right? Keithy, Fannin, Gadsden from Utah, Bowling Green, and Syracuse. I, I, we look pretty – we're lockstep with those guys at the top. 
Yeah, just, I mean, we I think we might have differing order of the top three, but I think those are solidified as the universally amongst all rankings as the top three. Uh, so it's almost pick your preference between between the three of them. Yeah, I mean, one guy that we added up because of his designation as well is Holden Willis, right? I think he's listed as receiver in fan tracks, but, you know, if you've got one of those leagues that changed the designation, I mean, we've got him up there at number four at receiver. So that was a name that kind of, when we had to realize what his designation was, we, he, man, he just all of a sudden got on top of that radar. He went from a mid-tier receiver to one, one of the top tight ends. Yeah, he's, I mean, he was one of their best pass catchers last year. And and I think, yeah, his designation, like you just said, uh, it absolutely changes his value between uh, a low level to undrafted receiver or a top five tight end. Yeah, just looking at your next three tight ends, RJ Maryland, Jake Brining-Stool from Clemson and Colston Loveland from Michigan. It feels like there's some good, just good security with those three guys there, right? Yeah, I I mean, Colson Loveland's going to be essentially Michigan's wide receiver one, right? It's a matter of how good the quarterback play is, but he's their best pass catcher, going to be a first-round pick um, in the NFL draft. Jake Brinningstool was a top-10 fantasy tight end last year, and Clemson essentially brings back everybody, so you don't think that that's going to change too much. I think he'll get similar to uh, his production from a year ago. And then RJ Maryland, like, I mean, I know you spoke about Jordan Hudson, but like, I think it's similar to what I said with Loveland, like Maryland is their best pass catcher, right? Yeah. Um, so if somebody does not emerge at wide receiver for SMU this year, I think, you, you know, RJ Maryland is going to be that safety blanket for Preston Stone. Yeah. We've got Tyler Warren at Penn state right there. Hard to have a tight end rankings without having an Iowa tight end. So we've got uh, Luke Lashy in there. You've got Mason Taylor at 10 for LSU. We both got him. In our top 20, I think that's somebody that maybe we thought underperformed last year, even given that high-powered LSU offense. Jack Velling from Michigan State, you know, that's sort of a system ranking right there. And you've got Sam Roche over there at Stanford, which, you know, another system-type ranking right there. Any any of those names really stand out? You want to take a deep dive on any of those guys? I mean, all of them, I think, are really solid. Just And I'm just going to run through it quick. Like, Jack Velling at Michigan State. Uh, who's their receivers who's their starting receivers i think he's going to be their best pass catcher he's already got rapport with aiden childs the the oregon state transfer so i really like him there um sam roush when he stepped in for ben urasek last year in the second half of last season there was no drop off right there was no drop off with sam roush there uh so he can obviously be a productive tight end uh, and then Tyler Warren's just somebody that I really, really like this year and I think is going undervalued. I mean, he had, what, six touchdowns last year as the yeah. backup, as the backup. And now yeah. he's got that position all to himself. Similar to Michigan State, like who are the Penn State wide receivers? I think Tyler Warren could be their number one pass catching option. So I really like um, him this year and he's getting NFL draft buzz. So there's no, there's no, sh- uh, yeah. he's not short on talent, right? You know, uh, your next four, Tana Cozio from Ball State, Luke Haas, Arkansas, Justin Jolie from NC State, Jolly, Bryson Nesbitt, North Carolina. Um, Anybody you want to touch on or go deep? I feel like you've mentioned the NC State tight end when we were talking about Grayson McCall when we were doing quarterbacks. Yeah, essentially a wide receiver, like playing tight end. All right. Uh, Had 80 targets and in in, an inept uh, UConn offense last year. Now you're stepping into a situation. Robert and I has really utilized the tight ends in the past. Um, I think he could be a top. He could end up easily as a top five uh, fantasy tight end this year. And, you know, we keep going down the list and I'm just going to talk overall. Tight end is really, really deep this year, in my opinion. Maybe not the star power at, at the top. Right. Uh, The star power was going to be if Dalvin Smith and Holden Willis had tight end eligibility. Right. Um, So maybe not the star power at the top that you need to go reach for like a Brock Bowers pass. But like the depth of tight end this year, I think, is really strong where you can wait till the latter rounds and get a really uh, good, safe option. Well, yeah, because one of the names that we're talking about, I mean, look, you got Cole Taylor from West Virginia. He comes back. I think he was the team's leading receiver last year. He cut 35 passes, four touchdowns. Uh, one of those situations where he was the team's best receiver last year. Now, they do have some names at receiver, but it's the system, too. They're going to be a run-heavy offense. 
And sometimes in these run heavy offenses, that, that that plays into the tight end, right? I mean, it has at Iowa over the years, it will at Michigan and, you know, West Virginia was no different, but to your point, even somebody that had that type of numbers last year in Cole Taylor usually comes back. You like, you're looking at that guy as like some sort of a top seven or eight tight end the next year. And this is a deep group of tight ends. I mean, there are some other names that we didn't even really get to and, and we will, but you know, Cole Taylor, you know, I think that's has tremendous value right there. And one name you've just recently added to your top 20. So I'll give you a minute uh, is the tight end from rice. Yeah. Bowden grown. Um, just, he was tremendous in the second half of last year. Uh, you lose Luke McCaffrey at, at wide out. Um, this is a very athletic tight end in a system, obviously uh, at rice that has utilized the tight end with the head coach, Mike Bloomgren dating back to his days at Stanford. Um, I think I wouldn't put it to say he's going to be their leading pass catcher per se, but there's, you know, a lot of question marks at wide receivers and he's essentially their most proven pass catcher coming back this year. Uh, and they should be pretty good throwing the football with EJ Warner at quarterback. So he's a guy I really like. And then another guy real quick that I moved into the top 10, uh, top 20, excuse me, probably should have had him there at that point. Uh, John Michael Gillenborg at, at Wyoming, when you get a coach and uh, I believe it was their offensive coordinator that stated, Hey, we are going to force feed this guy, the football, right? Uh, every single game, you love to hear that. Uh, and for a player's perspective of value. So he's a guy that I'm I'm really big on uh, this year as well. Yeah, look, and you look, there, there's a couple of names that I've got in there that that you don't have in there either. I think Anthony Lanfear over at Memphis, we talked about that high powered offense. He caught 29 passes and three touchdowns. And that, you know, that system is you can has has proven better tight ends, has has, has produced better tight ends in years past. So he's a guy that you can get down at that, you know, the tight end 20 range. We haven't even talked about Mitchell Evans yet at Notre Dame, who now is supposedly going to be healthy in the fall, which I'm looking at my cheat sheet. I, I I think I probably need to get him into my top 20. I mean, that's a name too, given Denbrock's system now over at Notre Dame, where usually tight ends have kind of thrived in that offense. I think that's a name now all of a sudden you've got to get up there on your radar in the top 20 tight ends as well. I want to see... I want to see what happens. I'll be, yeah. want to see what happens with him in fall camp Um, because his turnaround from the injury last year was very quick. quick, Right. And we'll see if, if everybody's telling the truth there that he's fully going to be ready for fall camp. So yeah, top, top five upside with Mitchell Evans. It's a matter of if he's going to play all 12 games and be healthy for that. I think there's only one more top one more tight end to discuss and then we could kind of put a bow on this thing i don't think we could discuss tight ends without talking about georgia they lose brock bowers okay you've got ben urisek coming in from stanford he wasn't there in the spring oscar delp was oscar delp played last year um i still like the potential of ben urisek in this system but it seems like in all the drafts that I have been in lately, he has fallen out of favor. And boy, you can get him really late. Um, you can get almost any Georgia tight end pretty at you know at, at good value. What are your thoughts on the Georgia tight end? Because I feel like this is a situation where you got to kind of play your gut right now because the smart decision for those that are more practical. Look at Urasek wasn't there in the spring and value Delp a little bit more right now. I'm still playing the, I like the upside receiver potential of Urasek in the fall. Your thoughts? Yeah, I, I wish he was there uh, in the spring, obviously. Uh, twofold for me. One, you don't necessarily know that Urasek's tight end one, right? Oscar Delp is a very talented player, four-star prospect. Um, and then... I'm of the opinion that, and I don't think, you know, I'm definitely not alone on this. There's other people out there that think this. I think they utilize the receivers more. I don't think there is a Brock Bowers per se in this tight end room. Uh, And I think you're going to see more targets funnel to Dominic Lovett in the slot. Uh, And some of those outside receivers like Colby Young came in, Um, you know, London Humphreys from Vandermilt. So they got a lot of names at receiver. And I just don't think, that the tight end utilization is going to be as high as it was in years past. But to your point, to your point, quick, uh, 
these guys are going late now. They're later, especially later than at the start of the offseason. So, you know, value's value, right? If if they're sitting out there in round 20 or something, take a stab, right? And then you can, if it's a redraft, you can cut them if they're not producing. Yeah, I think it's a great way to look at it. It's just the way that I see it's, it's all about value. And the fact that he wasn't there in the spring has created the value right now. And it's sort of the risk that you have to take, right? So, but that's it. Look, that's going to do it, man. Uh, look, we covered quite a bit of names. We gave a, a real brief run through of the tight ends, man. But, you know, the preview, pre, uh, the preseason preview series, a lot different this year. I really like the way we took a look at the positions. I think that's going to help people out with drafts. I know we'll have some more things coming up. You and I had talked about that. We're trying to trying to set the agenda for what we're going to do next as far as shows. So we'll get that squared away. But, you know, that's going to do it for this preseason preview show of the receivers. We've covered the quarterbacks, the running backs, the receivers. Don't forget, we got the preseason fantasy draft guide, preseason player projections. Those are going to be updated throughout the summer, all throughout fall camp. Just like Mike was saying in some of the players we were talking about, there's a lot of monitoring we have to do. And there's a lot of monitoring we have to do at very fantasy relevant positions all throughout the country. We'll be on top of it for you. So that's going to do it for this show. For my partner, Mike Bainbridge, my name is Joe DeSalvo with the CFF site. We'll see you guys soon.